My first guests are big stars in the world of sports, but they're here mostly not to talk about the art of passing, dribbling, and shooting, but to talk about the trend and the issue of athletes like Colin Kaepernick and now many others not standing for the national anthem before the games or doing other things to protest racial injustice in America. What you may not know is that Kaepernick wasn't the first major protest by professional athletes this year. In July, following the rapid succession of the shootings of Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, and the Dallas police officers, several different WNBA teams, including our own New York Liberty, began demonstrating support of the Black Lives Matter movement by wearing black warm-up outfits with phrases like hashtag Black Lives Matter and hashtag Dallas Five printed on them. Here is Tanisha Wright, a guard for the Liberty, speaking to the press after a game in late July. We really feel like there's still an issue here in America, and we want to be able to use our platforms. We want to be able to use our voices. We don't want to let anybody silence us in what we want to talk about. So you guys can ask away about anything that's happening in society. And um, it's unfortunate that the WNBA has fined us and not um, supported its players. So whatever you want to ask about that, feel free. But we'll only be taking questions about that today. Tanisha Wright at a post-game press conference in July, and as you could hear, whoever transcribed that clip did a very accurate job. Um, with me now are Swin Cash and Tina Charles, who played for Liberty this past season. And I will say this because Swin retired at the end of this past season, and we're both outspoken about their involvement with the protest actions. Hi, Swin and Tina. Welcome to the Green Space and WNYC. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So Black Lives Matter and the issues central to the movement have been in the news regularly over the past few years, obviously. What made you feel the need to finally speak out publicly this summer? Who wants to go first? Swin? Um, well, I think we were at a time in our country where a lot of not just um, African Americans, but um, I think everyone, humanity, um, watching people get killed. Um, day in and day out and violence that was happening in the streets. And now with so much technology, um, you talked about um, uh, the, the shootings that happened in Minneapolis and also in New Orleans. We just really got to a point where the players began to feel, what can we do? Like, this is an issue. Um, it was one of those things where we started communicating with one another. Players were wondering, they were feeling, they were hurting. And as a veteran myself, getting phone calls in the middle of the night of hearing another player crying, asking why, like, why don't we matter in our country? Why isn't anything being done? How can you kill somebody? How can it be live streaming and um, it be acceptable? Um, how can people not have any type of empathy for um, just human life in general? And I think it just got to a point as group as a group and as a league women we understand what it is to be oppressed at some point i mean if you're a woman at some point whether it's corporate america whether it's in college different things you've had to go through some issues and i think that's why we identified even more not only because we're african-american but because we are women and we have um, fathers and brothers and uncles and we understand what injustices have been happening in our country and we felt that we wanted to use our platform to really bring awareness to it and Tina, I think the Minnesota Lynx were the first WNBA team to wear Black Lives Matter warm-up outfits, though quickly spread to at least six of the WNBA's 12 teams, I see. Was there any organizing or coordination between players on the different teams? How did that go? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, Swin, she's the VP of our, of our union. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of information that was given to us as far as what was going to be done in the league and how could the New York Liberty participate. I think just us... Um, you know, I'm born and raised in Queens, New York. I grew up watching New York Liberty. I saw it as not just a dream to play for this team, but um, also as opportunity to use our platform. So I think if any team in the league, if we wanted to take a stand, it would have to be New York Liberty. And, you know, when we saw what Minnesota Lynx did, um, we just wanted to be on board with what they were doing and how we can support, you know, our fellow sisters in the league. Going back to Muhammad Ali's imprisonment as a result of protesting the Vietnam War, and Tommy Smith and John Carlos, black power fists in the 1968 Olympics. The history of professional athletes and activism goes back far. Uh, were you inspired by any other athlete protests in the past? Or did this just come up spontaneously as a present thing 
that you both feel you felt you wanted to be a part of? Swin? Um, I'll answer that question, but I wanted to just add that the shirts that Minnesota Lynx wore first, they didn't just have Black Lives Matter on it. They had shirts that had also um, support for the police uh, force, basically saying to pull everyone together. And they immediately got pushed back from the chief of the union. The cops walked out during a game um, against the players not even being there to protect them. So it was even a deeper layer of issues that happened there. And I want to encourage most of you to go read even more about that. But in regards to my encouragement, uh, I would say that we were just at a point in time where we had a decision to make, whether you stand up and use your platform or you worry about getting fined, you worry about losing sponsorship. And we don't make as much money as the men, but I, one of the things that I'm most proud of in my career, I've played 15 years in the WNBA, is that 144 women said, you know what, we can lose a lot right now. We can lose money, we can lose sponsorship, but we wanna stand up and have our voices be heard. So yes, you can look back and pull from Muhammad Ali, you can look back and pull from uh, you know, Dr. King, there's a number of people, but at the end of the day, if you look at the civil rights movement, besides it, beside every Dr. King, there's also a Dorothy Height. There's other women that were part of the movement and it wasn't just African-American women. And so that for us, if you look at WNBA, if you see us linked arms, it's just not the African-American women. That's the difference between our league and other protests is that you see foreign players, you see um, Asian, you see white, you see uh, Indian. Uh, these are all different people that came together for a purpose. You want to pick up on that, Tina? Do you feel it really brings a lot of different kinds of people together to do this? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I think especially with our league and just um, just other organizations that we put on the front line, uh, as far as the LGBT, um, as far as uh, breast cancer awareness, you know, we have Green Week. Um, so the fact that we were able to pick up on the Black Lives Matter movement, and it just wasn't African Americans that make up 70% of our league. You know, it was every race. So I think the, the unity that, that we showed of how important it is um, to raise awareness to what you believe in and stand up for what you believe in, um, it was just amazing to be a part of. And being that it's the 20th season in the WNBA, I think that was the, the major highlight of this season. Now, listeners, we can take some phone calls if you want to call in. For Tina Charles and Swin Cash from the Liberty, 212-433-WNYC, 212-433-9692. And I know those of you who f actually follow the WNBA are going, what? You have Tina Charles, the 2012 <laughs> WNBA Most Valuable Player, and you have Swin Cash. Oh, man, three-time champ. So 212-433-WNYC for you... Uh, Fanboys and fangirls out there, or for anybody who wants to talk about the issue, and anybody here in the green space, if you have a question, you can raise your hand, and uh, one of our producers will come around with a microphone, and we can take your questions, too. Um, so you guys came before Colin Kaepernick. What did you think when you saw him doing it, and then all of a sudden it was a big national deal on all the networks? Um. I think he's exercising his constitutional right, and I think he's forcing dialogue that we need to have conversations that's necessary to have. I think everyone has an opinion on how you should do something and how you should go about it, but he's actually taking a stand and doing it, and um, he's using his platform the same way that we did. Um, and I think he was very articulate as far as his research as to why he's kneeling instead of sitting down. Um, so what he's doing is um, really amazing, and he's he's sparking conversations that, that needs to that needs to happen, you know, in the same light um, after our Olympic break, you know, we were still trying to figure out how can we keep the conversations going. As you guys saw a preview of what Tanisha Ride and, and, and the rest of us decided to do to have a media blackout where we were only answering questions towards the Black Lives Matter movement because we wanted the conversations to keep going. So I think it's really um, great what Kaepernick is doing. And that's a different kind of protest. He, as everybody now knows, um, uh, didn't stand during the national anthem and then started kneeling during the national anthem. Uh, what you did was in a post-game news conference, you wouldn't take questions about the game. You would only take questions about the issues related to your shirts, right? Yeah, and I well, I, I initially started and I made a comment on the game. And so I made a comment about the game, gave them their their bite that they could use, and then everything else was, this is what we're gonna talk about. And so I thought it was very powerful, and I thought the way we went about it was very professional. And we've said throughout this whole um, summer, and even as we move forward, 
it's really about at the end of the day, we want to bring awareness and have conversations. Tina and I can sit here. What are some of my best friends? We don't agree on everything, but we can have respectful conversations and agree to disagree. Also, at the end of the day, like my dad served this country 30 plus years. My dad seen more time overseas and defending our country than I saw him growing up at times. And so when people try to have these conversations and they throw back in my face or want to talk about, well, if you're not, if you're protesting against the flag, you're protesting against our military. Well, let's talk about that. Let's have those conversations because I think I'm pretty equipped to have those conversations with you. Well, what do you what do you make of the fact that people I actually was surprised by that when it first came up with Kaepernick? that the pushback against it was, um, oh, you're disrespecting our war dead. And that was not, I don't think, what he had in mind as even being relevant to it. I mean, you know, maybe because the national anthem was, is a song that takes place during a, a battle. Um, but the country is not just our war dead. The country is everything about our country. And I think Kaepernick was surprised by the fact that what the critics focused on was war dead, when he was looking at the country as a whole and it's got great things about it, but it's still got oppression going on that we need to deal with and he wanted to take a stand. Are you surprised as the daughter of a veteran uh, uh, that, that that's where the, the pushback seems to rest? I, I wasn't surprised. And, and I say I wasn't surprised because I think it's like anything, it's like, if your mom or dad asks you a question and you don't want to answer it, you deflect to something else. And I think that's exactly what's happened is like, okay, we don't want to talk about what you want to talk about, but we're going to deflect and, and bring it to another issue. And so for me, as a kid whose brother served in the army, cousin, grandfather, my dad, um, it's insulting because you cannot compare those two things. Um, what our veterans and what our soldiers do and the sacrifices that they make, their families make um, to serve this country, it's so that I can make a decision whether I want to stand and be a part of this or if I want to say, no, we can do better as Americans. We can do better as a country. Um, and so when he exercised that constitutional right, like Tina said, how can we sit here and, and try to figure out when it's okay to stand or when it's okay uh, to kneel or do nothing. Like, who, who's dictating that? And I think that's the reason why conversations need to be had, intellectual conversations and respectfully as well. Let's take a comment or a question here in the green space. Uh, who do we have? Let's see, it's hard for me to see with these stage lights. Who's got the microphone? Is it, is it back there? Hi. <laughs> All right, no? You oh, guys are okay. Like, they're like, we're not touching this. No, uh, <laughs> that's right. Not in person. I love you all. <laughs> How are the, now, I can't see the phone lines from where I am, so I'm going to ask my producer, Megan, in the control room. Are the lines full? Okay. Yeah, I think people are. And now we do have a question uh, here in the hall, I think. But, uh, yeah, you know, right. sometimes people right, uh, will question. call in to say anything because they're anonymous, but when they get face-to-face... <laughs> Hi. Okay, now we got gotcha. you. Okay. Um, I, uh, I love your show. Thanks for having us all here. Um, so some people are discussing whether it's even appropriate to be having uh, the national anthem played at the beginning of the sporting events. I'm just wondering if you have a take on that. Um, I, I think it's appropriate. I think it's, I don't have a, a problem with the national yeah. anthem being played. We both played in the Olympics. We both have gold medals, and so we've yeah. we've gone and 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 been able to, to be the only team, yeah. thank, you. thank you, and been able to be the only team that's the only team that's standing there and hear your national anthem plate when you know that everyone else in the gym hates your guts. <laughs> um, and I also think that now you've seen like Megan Rapinoe, who uh, is on the national team with soccer, and she's been getting to kneel, and I think um, she's eloquently said exactly why she's doing it to support Kaepernick and, and what she feels are injustices. So. I don't think that there's a problem with it at all. Are there um, players who may not be inclined to display their politics in the athletic con uh, context kind of coming into conflict or dissension? Are there judgments going back and forth? Is it causing you know dissension between teammates? Is it on your team at all, Tina? Um, I think when it got to a point of the fines, um, I think that's when um, it became a little complex. You know, there's there's some uh, players on your teams that 
financially can be in a space of taking a fine and standing up for what's right. And then there's those that that's not. And then, you know, they have to think of what they want to stand for. And then it comes back to, well, if they really understand what's going on and, and thinking like, you know, well, I'm not African-American. So, you know, this isn't really my fight when when it's about Americans and, and, and being united, you know. Um, so that's going to drive you crazy, right? When, <laughs> when, when somebody says it's your fight because I'm not. Exactly. So you, so you hear that as well. Um, yes. So. For for me, you know, there there was a there was a game where where I still continued in the light of fines. I still continued to, to wear my shirt inside out mm-hmm. because I, I refused to be silent in, in the wake of the fines. You know, I, I I thought you know to myself, you know, growing up in Queens, I think back in '99, you think of Amadou Diallo, you think of Sean Bell in 2006. You know, so so for me, it was it was the bigger picture of if I didn't stand up for my right, me being from New York and me. Um, bearing witness to, to what happened back in the day when I was younger and going home to my parents and asking why this happened. Now technology is is booming and you're, we're able to see everything. So how, conversations how much, have to force. How everything. much were the fines? Um, 500? Yeah. It's 500? Yeah, you're talking about a $500, 500 fine. 500 and then leading to suspensions game. as well. Um, yeah. Per yeah. game over a number of games, however long you did it. And yeah. then they rescinded the fines after a while, right? Yes. They did. Well, that's what happens whenever you can stand together uh, yes. and you don't break off and go around. It's like anything. You want to change something, then you stand unified. And that's how uh, a movement works. That's how a union works. Mm-hmm. And we were able to get it done. But I do want to comment and say that when... Thank you, because that that's how you get it done. I want to comment and say that... Even when we were having, like, you have to understand, we're in a locker room, and people mm-hmm. have different money issues, and there's foreign players, and there's everything that's happening. Yeah. It wasn't like an easy thing, like, okay, yeah. this is what we're doing, and everybody fell in line. It was, let's talk about it, let's figure it out. And then it became a point where the players who've been in the league a little bit more said, you know what, I'll pay your fine, I'll yeah. pay your fine, and we'll yeah. keep moving forward. We'll keep so going. that's how a team yeah. operated. And, and for the record, that's, that's, that's what locker room talk is. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> Boom. That's what locker room talk is. Oh, yeah. Drop I got mic. Confused the last few days. <laughs> I just dropped the mic and walked out there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Boom. And WNBA president Lisa Borders eventually tweeted. Appreciate our players expressing themselves on matters important to them, rescinding imposed fines to show them even more support. Mm-hmm. So you feel you can applaud for that. <laughs> um, did that feel like too little, too late? Did that feel like oh, she's you know condescending to us, or was that like okay, we got something done here? Um, no, it, for for me it was like okay, now let's get to, let's come to the table and what are we gonna do moving forward? Like yeah. that that was, I don't know how you felt, Tina, but that's how I felt. No, I I thought it was um I thought it was amazing. You know the fact that you were able to see a result from what you stood up for. You know for what you worked hard for. Um, just like I saw in the civil rights movement, what I saw in movies, what I read about. So to be a part of something as moving as that, um, it was really special to me and you know now we're trying to figure out you know how can we engage with law enforcement and and, and force conversations within communities and, mm-hmm. and try to find a solution of how we could change the system mm-hmm. my guest if you're just joining us swing cash and tina charles from the liberty of the wnba on their protests this summer and things that flowed from it uh in support of black lives matter and relevant issues and we can take uh, some phone calls at 212-433-WNYC as we're here live in the green space today. We'll also go to our next audience member with a question, and we have somebody right over there. Hi. Hi. I, we did this entire unit at school about why, whether you should stand or shouldn't stand for the national anthem, and do you think it's good that people are making a stand like this? By the way, is school out today? <laughs> no. <laughs> this is part, part no. of the project, right? You're, you're here for a project, Do I need right? to no. report you to some... No. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to put you on the spot. But <laughs> sometimes... <laughs> we have one of the... One of, actually, one of the Brian Lair Show traditions has been that we have homeschool students call in to the show sometimes. Awesome. I mean, we don't solicit it, but it's something that's happened <laughs> over the years is that some people's parents who are homeschooling them, uh, actually use the show as kind of a midday public affairs thing on, on selected 
um, uh, se selected segments. So maybe that's the origin of that question. <laughs> but anyway, what's yeah. the answer? Um, I, I would say, uh, one, that's a great question. Two, I would say you live in the United States of America, so you have the right, whatever it may be, to stand, to kneel, to sit. Um, it's your choice, and that's why we live here in the greatest country in the world. And so I think you have to read, understand what you stand for, and then make that decision. Okay? That's my opinion. <laughs> now, your mom may have a different opinion, but as you get older, my mom once said to me, even when I was growing up and I would go to church and I would go to church all the time, my mom would always tell me at some point you'll find the faith for yourself. And when you do, then you'll be able to make those decisions for yourself. So keep seeking understanding and keep seeking knowledge. So and that's in all things, not just in the protest, whether you stand or um, if you deal. Let me ask the control room uh, to pick out a call. I can't see the callers from the green space stage on my computer out here. So if there's a caller uh, you guys want to pick out, we'll, uh, we'll go to a caller. In the meantime, maybe I'll ask you a, a basketball question. Oh, that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> will you answer basketball? I realized, considering the topic, I don't know if you'll answer basketball questions. Um, the, from what I've read, the WNBA would lose money and likely go out of business if not carried by the NBA teams you're affiliated with, like the Liberty by the Knicks. Assuming that's actually true, why do you think the league is committed to the existence of the WNBA? I think Swin should answer that. She's a VP. Of the union, of the players' union. union. So I'm gonna let her <laughs> handle that question. Well, um, one, I think that I'll say this, the WNBA is the best league in the world and players from all around the world want to come here and play for a reason. I will say that the business side, um, just like everyone else did when um, we had the recession that happened, the WNBA suffered as well. Of course, we get some support from the NBA. There are some teams that are profitable, but at the end of the day, please believe the WNBA being successful and being here is good business also for the NBA. I think when you support women, when you're inclusive and you understand that they also should have a platform, then that's good for your business. And as you see in corporate America, more people are starting to understand that we need to be at the table. So for the WNBA, we need to be here, we need to be present, and for young girls and young boys to look up and say, hey, I can be like the next Tina Charles. I can be the next, next Epiphany Prince and whoever else it may be. So for me, I think, yes, it should be. For people who, who don't know the, the game, the you know professional women's basketball, can you promote the women's game? Like I'm thinking as a tennis fan, there are th different things sometimes that I appreciate about the women's game than the men's game. They're not exactly identical. What makes it fun and different from men's basketball? Is there any... Would there be any to answer to the, that? I would have to say the skill. Yeah. You know. Um, what just, are you saying? <laughs> I would just say skill. Period. Um, you know, with 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 men, you know, everything is athletic, athleticism. You know, jumping out of the gym, the dunks, and everything. No, we have to practice our skill um, as far as how much we play as as a team. You know, um, what's necessary for us to win is different than what's necessary for um, for the NBA players, for the team in the NBA to win. Um, for us, it, it takes five to win, literally. Um, and just knowing our offense, knowing our defense, um, the discipline we have to have, the patience you have to have, um, the development of the game, I, I would just have to say our, it's our skill. Yeah, and it's amazing that you know everyone loves Golden State right now. They move the ball, they shoot the ball. I'm like, well, we've been doing that we've for a number that. of years. But for okay, and uh, it's like it's pure basketball, and yeah. it's fun, and it's skills. And yeah. so I agree with Tina. For sure. But the criticism of Golden State is... Uh, you know, it's really about one guy's amazing shooting skill and that other teams uh, have such incredible teamwork and some people, root, you know, might have rooted for uh, Cleveland over them uh, for that reason to take an NBA example. But do you think it takes more teamwork? Is that part of what you're getting at in yeah. the women's game? Because the men's game is more about individual showboating. And more like one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, I mean, definitely throughout the league, you know, you have amazing players that, that are one-on-one players. You have your Angel McCartry, Elena Deladon, um, Skylar Diggins. You have the all likes of them. But I think for the elite teams down the road, when it comes down to it, the ones that made it are the ones that have discipline in their offense and in their defense. 
to use the triangle offense like Phil Jackson tries to get the Knicks to do? <laughs> we use elements of the triangle. Yeah. We do. Um, we have a player like Tina Charles that no one can check her on a low block. We want to get her to basketball and we want to kind of move off of her. And I know I'm talking basketball terminology, so let me rewind that a little bit. Uh, Tina Charles, very dominant. We can throw the ball into her and she can score, <laughs> which is great for us. But whenever they come to double team her, I can move and get a shot very easily so for us basketball wise um it, it's good to have dominant players but it's also good to play together what else are you into sports wise tina you fan of other particular sports i love softball actually i know that was very left field but um, <laughs> i love softball i love baseball only if you're righty and pull the ball <laughs> i love baseball um, my mom was a season ticket holder of the mets back in the days in the 80s so I love to get out to City Field as much as I can. Um, I know we just lost the wild court game, but um, we'll be back next year. That's that. That's another one where, like, you know, women's soccer, pretty big. Women's tennis, pretty big. Do you think it's harder with basketball and baseball, the softball, you know, being the, the, the pro uh, women's game, um, that and basketball for some reason to catch on? Um, No, I think... Um, when it when it comes to to all those other sports that you just named, um, I think I, I love personally team sports. I grew up as an only child, so I loved being around others, learning from others. Um, you know how do they engage and 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 have respect for others? Um, just the discipline that they have and their approach to the game. Um, individual sports wasn't really necessarily something for me, but everyone loves one on one dominance, and I think you see that in Serena Williams. You know, you see that in your Andy Murray, you know, so um, for me, I'm all about team sports. Swin, in terms of, you know, it becoming big in the marketplace for a, a whole, whole lot of fans. Um, I think that the issue that we've struggled with on the WNBA side is that everyone always wants to compare us to the men. And that's because basketball in the United States is it's at the top. And so when a man's sport is at the top, it's very difficult for people to see it on the women's side and also respect it. So we have to fight with writers to talk about our players. We have so many great women that have so many stories, but if mass media is only looks one way and is not diverse and doesn't want to talk about our stories, then it's very difficult for people to follow. You're going to follow Swing Cash if you know about me, if you identify something with me. Oh, she likes fashion. I do too. You know what? I'm going to go see her play. She's really cool. I'm following her social media. That's why we, it's all about branding and marketing. And it's the struggle for us is really getting to the mainstream media to let them cover us the same way that they cover the men. You talked about individual sports. Of course, people can see the dominance in Serena. You talk about women's soccer. Our men's soccer team is not that good. So everybody's looking at the women's team. I love our men's soccer team, but I'm just saying. So every couple of years, when it's a major um, global event, you follow the soccer team. I mean, does anybody in this room know that six gold medals in a row, that's the most the women's basketball team has done? No one else has touched that globally. But do you hear those stories? Do you hear those stories? It's like people, it's like, why are they dominating? Somebody needs to be close to them. Why? We're America. Don't we try to dominate everything? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what we struggle with. Kristen and Montclair, you're on WNYC. Hi, Kristen. Hey there. Um, I just wanted to thank both Tina and Swin for standing up and the whole team for standing up because I know it's not easy, especially on social media with pushback and some people just don't oh, understand that you know, the message or their willfully misunderstanding. But I also wanted to ask um, if they are actively encouraging other teams and leagues to join in the protest, and if so, how are they doing that and what responses they've received from um, other teams and other team members? So um, thank you very much for your comments. Um, we really appreciate the support. I would say that uh, once we got back from the Olympic break, Phoenix, Indiana, a couple of teams have already started in the communities as far as not only hosting town halls, but behind closed doors, bringing community um, leaders together and having conversations with some of the local leadership that's already started. Um, I've had conversations already with the NBA as they're kicking off their league. You'll see even more social engagement from the NBA side. So this is really kind of a WNBA, NBA family um, thing where we're coming together and trying to make sure we're using resources, not just protesting and talk about it, but also putting dollars into these communities to try to bridge the gap because it's it's really needed. And the way that we can do that is everyone loves sports. So we're trying to really bring people together using sport as a way to start the conversations. Tina, you back with the uh, Liberty next year? You, you signed? 
Yeah, I'm back. I'm back. Right. <laughs> I'm going anywhere. Feel good about that. <laughs> That's, right. That's right, because she's one of the very best in the league. So, listeners, if you weren't aware of the WNBA before and Tina Charles before, now you've heard her. You have a sense of her as a human being. Maybe you'll tune in next uh, next summer mm-hmm. and uh, and and watch a little WNBA basketball and Swin Cash. I'm gonna. You know, at the risk of uh, embarrassing you, <laughs> tell everybody what one of the first things is you're going to do now that you've retired from basketball, which is that I see next week you're being honored by the National Civil Rights Museum with their Freedom Award, yeah. which recognizes <laughs> thank you, thank you, recognizes outstanding individuals who have contributed greatly to civil and human rights, and she'll be accepting the award alongside people like Tawakal Carmen, the youngest ever winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. And Brian Stevenson, who's been on this show, the high-profile lawyer, activist, and writer. Do you have any jitters about that? Uh, it's a little bit. Uh, it was, it's really an honor. Um, throughout my life, um, I always live by the creed, to whom much is given, much is required. And I've tried to live my life in a way to give back because of the platform that I have. And so I, I'm excited about it. And I'll be accepting the award, but not just only on my behalf, but for all the other women in the WNBA as well. I think this summer really went close to home for me, and so I want to make sure that I acknowledge them as well. Swin Cash and Tina Charles, thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up next, Mayor de Blasio.